right, guys, we are here at Sydney Motorsport Park. This has been a long time coming. Thank you to Haltech and World Time Attack Challenge for making this happen once again. If you somehow missed it, we are here in Australia. In the container behind me is the Ferrari. We are here to compete this weekend. Let me rewind a little bit, show you how we got here, and then let's unload this thing. It's hard to believe that it was only back in March that we received a call from our friends at Haltech and with it, an invitation to come to Sydney, Australia to compete in the World Time Attack Challenge. At the time of that phone call, we had a car that had never been driven in less than 100 days to transform it into a competition-ready race car. But here we are at Los Angeles International Airport, ready to board a 17-hour flight to make a dream come true. With us, of course, are our clothes and camera gear, but also the entirety of our spares package for the Ferrari. Just two Pelican cases are carrying everything we hope we'll need in order to successfully turn laps at Sydney Motorsport Park. Now, if you're thinking it would have been a lot easier to send this stuff in the container with the car, you'd be right, except we didn't even have most of these parts in hand when the car had to ship out back at the beginning of June. As a result, before we even got off the ground, our trip was off to a tumultuous start. Our big Pelican case tipped the scales at 125 pounds. The desk clerk informed us we'd have to get the weight under 99 in order to put it on the plane. So thus began the arduous process of moving heavy parts from the Pelican case to our clothing bags just to get it below weight. We had to get crafty and it took a few attempts, but eventually we got well below the threshold and settled it 91 pounds. We did it! Dude, we fucking got it. We got it. All right. We're in. <laughs> or at least that's what we thought, and so did the clerk, until we informed him we're international travelers, and that means the bag limit is 70 pounds. We gotta pull 20 more pounds out of it. For what reason? They won't, I can't have it over 70 pounds. Oh, I was 99. <laughs> With 20 more pounds to cut from our luggage, it became a decision-making process of what could come along and what needed to go in the trash. We inched closer and closer to that 70-pound limit, eventually landing at 71 while our personal bags were bursting at the seams and pushing the limits of their zippers. But by removing my hood prop, we finally crossed the mark and landed on 69. With that hurdle cleared, we made it onto our flight and settled in for the long night ahead. My uncanny ability to sleep through anything meant that I slept for the first 11 hours of this behemoth flight while the rest of the gang stayed awake watching a number of movies, most of which weren't any good at all. Ladies and gentlemen, good morning and welcome to Sydney local time here, approximately 6.57 a.m. Please remain seated with your seatbelts fastened until the captain parks the airplane at the gate, turns off the fastened seatbelt sign. Our Friday night departure from Los Angeles put us into Sydney, Australia bright and early on Sunday morning. And upon landing, we promptly retrieved our rental cars and did a few hours worth of sightseeing knowing the rest of the trip was about to get a whole lot busier. With some touristy stuff out of the way, it was back to business. So we stopped in at the local hammer barn and picked up all the stuff we had to throw away at the airport and a handful of things we just didn't bring with us. Stuff we figured would be easier to buy down under instead of lugging through airport security. We're talking zip ties, rivets, every form of tape you can imagine, all of the things you come to expect with your typical Stanceworks quality build. After a beer run and then a night of sleep at our atrocious Airbnb, we were off to the track bright and early Monday morning to finally get a look at the Ferrari and what kind of condition it's actually in. It's been at sea for two full months and landed in Australia on the afternoon of August 17th. But when we got to the track, there appeared to be a bit of a problem. What was that? Uh, we're with one of the cars. Yeah, because <laughs> the, um, apparently, like, of the containers are still stuck in customs, oh. so they're only getting like cleared or something now. <laughs> um, 
So it, do you know, that's definitely your container? We don't know. That's what I was going to look up right now to see uh, if that one's us or not. Yeah. Because we definitely. were told to be here at 8, but that was... Not What's what? the word? Containers are currently stuck in customs. What is? You are? The containers. Still? Yeah, they're supposed to be released at 9 a.m. So... Are they here? No. Oh. They're going to bring them here. That container still has its customs seal. And apparently they're going to release the containers from customs at 9 a.m. Bring them here with customs agents. So and we will here like dude. And open them. We don't know for certain, but so it's like we got they the morning. will open them here with customs agents to go through them. So. And so began the process of waiting and waiting and waiting some more. That fear in the back of my head where I worried, what if for some reason the car gets stuck in customs and after all of this time and money, I'm unable to race here in Australia. But with downtime on our hands, we decided we'd make the best of it. And we went over to Australia's version of O'Reilly's or AutoZone known as Super Cheap Auto to get some much needed parts and pieces. This has acid in it though. You think they have an AGM battery in there it? Oh, I mean, I guess if we get the wrong one, we can come back and find something different. But... I had shipped the Ferrari to Australia without its battery in place. Following all sorts of bad news from lithium batteries and salt water, I decided it was the smart idea. Only problem being, it was quite difficult to find any sort of battery in the same form factor as what I was running back home. Australia is known for taking its motorsport regulations very seriously, and if the battery doesn't fit securely within its mount, well, we're not going to be allowed out on track. But we'll solve that one later. We went back to the track after we finished our errands and met Alan from World Time Attack along with the whole crew from Haltech Australia. Spirits were back on high because a few phone calls had been made and questions were answered. Our missing container was simply the result of a clerical issue. It had been released from the port and should be arriving at the track any minute. However, we weren't out of the woods quite yet. Although the container did arrive successfully at Sydney Motorsport Park, there was still the actual customs clearance process to allow the car to touch down on Australian soil. The Australian government is incredibly strict about what they let in and out of the country. Foreign contaminants like seeds or insects pose a huge threat to their environment. And as a result, everything inside of the container must be thoroughly checked to make sure we don't introduce any invasive species to the native wildlife. We cleaned the Ferrari for days before it left, so fingers crossed. Uh, we're by security officers. Oh, okay. So Australia being an island country, um, we're not, all our species and environment hasn't really had any sort of interaction with other countries. Like for example, America, you know, Canada and Mexico. So there is that sort of interaction happening. Because our animals, plants, environment hasn't evolved to cope with other sort of pests and diseases outside, it's actually quite detrimental. Um, and the best example that I tell people is, is this um, beetle called the Capra beetle. And it's a, a small little beetle, it's probably about two mil thick, and it eats grains and it's prolific. In other countries, the species of rice that have gone through that, they've learned, the environment has learned to adapt with it, so they're able to cope. If we were to get that beetle to come here, um, and if it was to get into our farming crops and all that, we lose $40 billion a year because our grains and exports here in Sydney is one of the most pest disease free in the world. Oh, and the demand for overseas to ask for our grains is so high. That's how our economy is. So that's why we're very strict. Given that I'm not Elon Musk and can't afford to waste $40 billion, we made absolutely sure that the Ferrari would glide through customs, given how much time we spent cleaning it up. But we didn't expect customs to check for hydrocarbons, and almost immediately, we were told we had to clear the area while the container aired out. Thankfully though, this wasn't seen as a big deal, and within 15 or so minutes, we were allowed to help get things unload while the customs guys gave everything a once over. Inside of this container was Ryan Turk's Formula Supra, Ferris Quartemi's C6 Corvette, and of course, perched on top, the Ferrari 244 GTK. Car looks pretty good. I think we're in pretty good shape. It doesn't look like it got very rusty, which we were kind of worried about. The only problem is we leaked a little bit of oil out of the back of the car onto some uh, kind of totes underneath it. And I think that's just because of the steep angle that the car is at. We had some kind of backflow through the return line from the turbo sump pump. 
that's not related to the dry sump. It's a complicated system, but everything looks really good. I think we've just got a little bit of engine oil that came out. Thankfully, not a big problem. We've got a big week coming up to get it all ready. Seems like it should be good though. I'm excited. Despite the fact that shipping containers are not hermetically sealed, we were quite surprised at how dirty the Ferrari got during transit. Perhaps the car just sat outside before it was loaded in, or maybe containers get dustier than I imagined, but it had a solid layer coating every surface. Despite that fact though, after looking under the hood and the engine cover, our customs agent was satisfied with how clean the car was as a whole and let us pass on through uninterrupted. The Ferrari was officially on Australian soil, and this brought to an end one of the most stressful few month stretches of my entire life. I felt like I finally had my car back. But within minutes, it was time to load it up and send it on over to Haltech so we could begin the once over process. Thankfully, Haltech's not too far away only about 10 minutes from the track itself, making it a great home base for us to get the car ready. But before we start turning any wrenches, or in the Australian's case, spanners, Haltech wanted to get some press photos done to promote the fact that the car had indeed made it safe and sound. James set up some lights, whipped out his camera, and did what he does best, and the results are fantastic. These are easily some of my favorite photos of the car to date. All right, so car is safe and sound here at Haltech. Again, none of this would be possible without them. They're gonna keep it overnight. We're gonna come back tomorrow and get started on the process of getting it a bit more cleaned up. We just did a quick and dirty job. We're gonna go through nut and bolt the whole thing and get it ready, maybe even put it on the dyno and get tuned for some new fuel, which I'm pretty excited about. These guys have been awesome. I'm stoked that it's here. This is a reality, it has officially happened. This is a dream come true. Fingers crossed we run into no issues and we'll be on track in no time. And that means it's time for day three. With a lot to accomplish and time ticking by way quicker than initially anticipated, Scott was kind enough to sit down with us and put together a game plan. Our test sessions with the Ferrari mean that it drives well enough, but there's still a lot of details and settings within the Nexus R5 that Scott can fine tune to make the driving experience that much better. Namely, we're looking for gear indication, flat shift functionality, fail safes, and a safe tune for 109 fuel here in Australia, since we won't be running the 110 octane we were running back home. But better known as Tuning Fork, most of you guys probably already know this is Scott Hilsinger's specialty. And in going with the trend of Haltech being one of the most hospitable groups of people I have ever met, they were kind enough to give us full access to Scott and his wealth of knowledge and experience to get the Ferrari fine-tuned to perfection. But not before some fresh merch showed up bright and early. Well, now I feel like I gotta change. There we go. Stoked on it. Awesome, guys. Thank you so much for the privilege. Hell yeah. And with the Stanceworks logo on the front? With John's Stanceworks logo on the front? So will people be able to buy this online or is it only at the event? At World Time Attack. Okay. Yeah. So I also need to do a story with you too. I know people will be asking. So I have to say, hey, only place to get it. Better book that ticket to Australia right now. <laughs> all right, all right, enough standing around. I know what most of you are actually here for and the reason all of you actually watch this channel is for work on this car. And on the surface, it might seem like there's not much to do. After all, just a handful of months ago, we got the car out on track for its first test sessions, two on back-to-back -back weekends, one at Button Willow and one at Willow Springs. In those test sessions, we proved that the car is ready to turn laps. We worked through some of the teething pains of a fresh project and solved a lot of the issues that reared their head. Today, it's about crossing T's and dotting I's. Uh, the car looks pretty good though. Uh, everything still looks intact from the trip, nothing, no major rust or anything, didn't get damaged. The uh, the way it was put on the 
the rack on the container. It was kind of sitting on the frame rails in a couple spaces, but it doesn't look like it damaged anything majorly. So it's looking good so far. Okay, so no surprise there. That's probably what everyone expects. But there is still quite a bit of work to do. There are hoses rubbing in different places, there are nuts and bolts that need tightening, and leaks to solve just to start things off. Not to mention some light fabrication to meet safety regulations tomorrow. But we should be able to knock things out pretty quickly given the size of the team we have. So let me introduce them. First up, we'll call him Mike Sr., my dad there on the right. He was eager to come on the trip and get his hands dirty. The rest of the crew you guys might recognize. We've got Justin from U-Joint Off-Road, Byron from Lightbow, and my buddy John Salerno. Not to mention Anthony running the camera to make this episode as good as it is. It was a divide and conquer process where everybody picked a job and stuck with it. The coolant hoses and brake lines that were facing potential wear through were secured and reinforced, while any potential leaks underneath the car were identified and cleaned so that we could pinpoint them in the future should they reoccur. Uh, there's a little bit of a drip right here on the bottom side of the oil pan, so we're just checking all the uh, oil pan bolts to make sure they're all nice and tight. But on top of that, there are some other changes that we had planned for before the car even left the United States. So let's rewind again. Some of you may remember the brake bias testing we were performing while we were at Willow Springs. And what we found was that the rear wheels lock just before the fronts on threshold braking, even with the bias set all the way forwards, requiring a pad change. We reached out to the folks at AP Racing and they sent over a pad compound one step down from what was already on the car. We packed our new brake pads in our carry-on luggage and then performed the rapid install on the lift at Haltech. This simple change should fix any brake bias issues present on the car previously, but the only way to find out is to drive it on track once again. We've got a loose transmission bolt, which is not ideal, uh, but thankfully that's what we're here doing. We're checking everything. Uh, and a lot of these bolts haven't been tightened since the first time the car was on the track. Uh, but we're just going through literally every single nut and bolt on the car. We're going to mark them all with a paint marker once we've confirmed everything is tight and we should be ready for track duty tomorrow. But chasing down any potential failure point is exactly what we're here to do. So I'm totally fine with finding flaws because it means we're preventing a problem. Everything so far though has only scratched the surface and there's still some heavy lifting to do, starting with some light fabrication by building a patch panel to close one final hole in the firewall. It's a port originally intended for the HVAC unit, and it's big enough to fit at least one hand through. So we're gonna rivet some aluminum in place to close it off and meet our rule book. While we're at it, we're also gonna clean up the roll cage. I noted in a previous episode that we coated the entire thing in cosmoline to prevent rust while it was traveling over the ocean, but cosmoline is a bit sticky and can create a mess, so I wanna remove anything anywhere we might touch to prevent from ruining my race suit or just tracking it everywhere. And then of course, there's the last minute addition of one more sponsor to our livery, our friends at Vibrant Performance who have supported the project from the day it began. Along with adding them to our livery, we're also gonna be updating to their new version of the HD clamps. Some of you may remember, it was actually the loss of an HD clamp that cut our first track session short in the Ferrari. It wasn't so much that the part itself failed, but that the locking pin mechanism is easy to misinstall and thus I blame myself, but hence the redesign. So this is the old style Vibrant HD clamp. It's what we had before, and they have a huge pressure rating, but the only downside to them is if you don't get these, fully, these pins fully seated, which I think is what happened on our first track day. If you don't have it all the way in there to lock it in place, it can vibrate its way out, and if it vibrates its way out, then uh, it's gonna open up and you can lose it. So we're swapping everything over to Vibrant's new style clamp, which no longer has a pin that can come out. So this one's held captive and it's a locking pin. If you press it and then open the latch, the whole thing opens up. It's sprung loaded, spring loaded. So it works much better, easier to do with one hand. You can assemble the whole thing. You don't have to fiddle with a pin and even more secure than before. To install them, we don't have to make any changes to the car itself, it's just a matter of pulling the old clamps off and installing the new ones. Even the o-rings and the internal sleeves are all the same. It's a straight transfer.
And just like that, it's done. We've got four in total that we're gonna swap over, which will make serviceability easier, and it means we won't lose a clamp on track this time around. So one more final and special thanks to Vibrant for joining the team and sponsoring the car and giving us the opportunity to do cool things like this instead of shilling mobile phone games. Uh, so we had to come up with a new battery. They size their batteries differently here than in America. So we were having a little bit of a problem finding something that fit in here. We found this one, which is a wet cell battery, which is no good. We don't want that in case of an accident. We don't want that splashing anywhere. So we went out and find a AGM motorcycle battery that was pretty close. And we kind of cobbled together a solution to bolt on some terminals to it so we didn't have to change the ends on the cable. So now we just need to come up with a quick solution to figure out what needs to be done to keep this in the battery box nice and snug and we're all set on a battery. Well, my first place I go when I'm looking to solve a problem in most cases is around the dumpster. Usually find what you need. What we've got here, it's a good old two by four from North America. That's exactly what we need. There we go. Cut a couple inches off of this puppy and we've got ourselves a secure battery. Oh yeah. Not going anywhere. Making sure no hoses are rubbing anything so we don't run into any like rub through issues on the track. We had a couple that are real tight just because there's no space in this car. So we're just wrapping some silicone around the outside of it, put some zip ties in there, and adds a little extra layer of protection. But now, finally, I think we're ready for the dyno. Our first goal is to make sure that we're tuned properly for VP's 109. Australia does not allow leaded race fuels, so the 110 we normally run back in North America is a no-go. Now, of course, the octane rating for these two fuels is really close, so we shouldn't really see a difference. But given the fact that Haltech has a dyno and is willing to do some tuning for us, why not strap it down and make absolutely sure we won't face any issues? As said at the beginning of the episode, we're not a professional race team here, and I cannot afford to break anything unnecessarily. But while plugged into the computer, Scott also took the time to set up our gear position sensor. Some of you pointed out in the comments in previous episodes that while on track, I had no indication of what gear I was in on my dash. I was having to memorize what gear I was in at any point on the track, which can be a challenge with the sequential given that you can't feel what gear you're in by just the position of your hand. While cycling through the gearbox though, it was clear something wasn't quite right. Scott wasn't seeing the information he anticipated he'd see, and thus he had to dive in and take a deeper look. Interesting. I'm getting gear adjustments on my dash now. You read that same thing? One is ground. Three is five volts, which is going to be our green. Green. Three. Yellow is a signal wire, which is the one in the middle. Would you mind humoring me and just flicking up and down a couple of gears and just let me know what's going Just whichever way, say reverse, 288, neutral. Uh, the next gear, the next gear. Danger. Oh, man. If there's one thing that gets me hyped up, it's hearing an Australian like Scott say danger with excitement. After fiddling with the sensor, he got it working, and now it's finally time to fire the car up for the first time in months. Might not be, I don't know. With Scott's confirmation that everything looks good under the hood, all that's left is to bolt on the missing wheel and tire and to lower this thing back down to planet Earth. Honestly, I would have argued that the car was ready for yet another track session the second we unloaded it from the container. But for our team of five, it was a 10-hour push just to get it to this point. 
It goes to show you can never be too thorough in preparation. For the first time ever, I could actually tell when the car was in reverse without having to check with the clutch. It's admittedly a simple detail, but man does it feel like an important one. So as Scott straps this thing down, let's go over what we're aiming to accomplish on the dyno, because I need to be clear, we're not looking for any sort of power figure. What we want is a bulletproof safe tune for the 109 octane fuel, and we want Scott to work his magic and set up the mythical flat shifting for our sequential transmission. You guys have been asking about this ever since our first drive video. Now it's finally time to set up the details that allow the flat shift settings to work so we don't have to lift off the throttle between gears. First things first, just put the engine under load so Scott can check the air fuel ratios and make sure everything looks good as far as our fuel. With the basics out of the way and our fail safes in place, I actually traded places with Scott. Believe it or not, he climbed into the car and fit, and then he turned it up. Scott was quite complimentary of Andrew Molina's fuel mapping, so we moved on to the flat shift tuning of the transmission. After some time spent rowing through the gears and making small modifications on the Haltech Nexus R5, Scott signed off on our flat shift tune. When we pull on the shift lever, the ECU cuts both spark and fuel, meaning we don't have to lift the gas pedal during shifts, making for lightning quick changes between gears, which makes for a faster car and allows me to focus more on the drive. I don't know whether it's easier to get in or out of the car for a seven foot tall giant, but Scott pulled it off and then handed it back to me one more time to test it out. It's hard to put into words why shifting the transmission without ever lifting the throttle is as cool as it is, but man, this is by far one of the coolest experiences I've had behind the wheel of this car so far. It really feels like true race car shit. It's just yet another way that Haltech has taken this project above and beyond anything I ever thought that it originally could be. But with that, I actually think we're done preparing the car. It should be ready for its first session out on track. Tomorrow evening, it goes to Sydney Motorsport Park for a few festivities, and then on Thursday morning, we find out what this car is actually made of. I've said it so many times before, but this truly feels like a punctuation point on this build. Perhaps not a period, but a colon. It's something we've been working towards for two and a half years. So trust me when I say episode two is going to be insane. But we're not done yet. During our time at Haltech, our host and hero Richard was willing to give us the full tour of their facility to show us how this awesome equipment is actually made, because believe it or not, 
Haltex systems are built entirely in-house, from the circuit boards to the software that runs them. All Haltech ECUs have their circuitry laid out and printed by these machines right here, and it's capable of producing a board in just a couple of minutes. So for my subscribers that are interested in both manufacturing and inventory, this means they don't have to keep thousands of them on the shelf at once. Instead, they make them as customers need them. But to that end, that means Haltech has complete control over the quality assurance process. As Richard put it, they don't want to be responsible for blowing up someone's $100,000 engine, so every single board and component is tested before it leaves the factory and gets to customers' hands. But to clarify, it's not just the circuitry and electronic components that are made here. Everything is also assembled in-house. Each member of the crew back here is trained on a specific product, and thus knows it intimately both inside and out. After the finishing touches have been put on by hand, once again, everything is tested. Any rejects are sent to a completely different unit within the building, while everything that checks out is packaged up. They go on a quality control, they, we have a program that runs them, it heats them up really hot, runs a whole pile of processes through it, so that's QC that, QC1 that go through, um, and then once they've passed that test they get cased, um, and then once they're cased they go back on a pro QC process again because, you know, when you've got a... Yeah, anything could uh, happen. ...got a twenty, thirty, fifty, hundred thousand dollar engine, we don't want to be the, the, the reason that blew up. Yeah. <laughs> I have told anyone that will listen anytime they ask that I had more or less every standalone company I'm capable of naming, except for maybe one or two, offer up their equipment for the Ferrari build. I kind of had my choice. But now that you've seen the capabilities of what the system and the car can do, along with how thorough and quality controlled the products themselves are, or even the fact that it's an enthusiast-run company, that really cares about what they're doing, well, it should be pretty obvious why I chose Haltech to partner with. That's incredible. Yeah, I, I, Sydney. I don't think that I really understood how much of it happens here. I mean, yeah. I know that it, it is, oh, it's made in Australia and all this and that, but it's like to see it all under one roof, bottom to top, even down to the software is getting written upstairs is incredible. Yeah, That's well, sick. yeah. I know when I partner with a company, it's an endorsement that goes both ways. And I want you guys, as my supporters and viewers, to have absolute confidence in every brand that I bring to the table and work with. So if this doesn't seal the deal for Haltech, I don't know what will. So here's to them and the rest of our sponsors for bringing us on this journey. And I hope you guys come back next week for episode two.